Welcome to the Hermetic Astrology Podcast. I'm Gary Caton, and I'm here with Sister Seven Brimner, Marlena Seven Brimner, author of Hermetic Marriage of Art and Alchemy. I don't know if you can see that there. Let's see. There we go. Yeah. This is her second book. We had her on the show last July to talk about the first book, which is Hermetic Philosophy and Creative Alchemy. So welcome back to the show, Seven. Oh, thanks so much, Gary. It's a pleasure yeah. to be back. Yeah, definitely. It's been a, an absolute joy reading these two books. Really, the, the breadth of what you've done here is amazing. Um, you know, it's so comprehensive. I'm really, like, very impressed with that. And I guess the first thing that I wanted to ask you has to do with that, because when I was thinking about that, I was like, I, I was reminded, um, I don't know if you know who Richard Tarnas is. Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay. So I remember Richard speaking about, you know, he wrote The Passion of the Western Mind, which was his big, you know, opus on Western philosophy. And then he wrote Cosmos and Psyche. And he said that he literally wrote Passion of the Western Mind to be like a springboard so that cosmos and psyche could be could have something to rest on that would make it more acceptable yeah and and i was like you know these two books kind of remind me of that because like you go through the philosophy in the first book which is sort of like the sort of the bedrock or the uh, whatever image you want to use but kind of the foundation for you know where this these ideas come from and then you go into more of the art which in this case is the alchemy and not it there is astrology too but so i'm just wondering like was that planned from the beginning was that conscious did did you plan to do both books from the beginning well you're exactly right that um the first book is like a foundation for the second book mm -hmm. however originally i had envisioned it all as one book uh -huh. uh, which would have just been massive you know and <laughs> i'd probably still be working on it but when i <laughs> submitted the idea to the publishers, they asked if I could break it into two books. And mm -hmm. I think that was so smart of them. Um, and pretty quickly, I was able to see how the two books would be two separate entities and awesome. how they would complement each other. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So that was actually really great. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. I think it worked out really well because, you know, like I said, it reminds me of, of what Tarnas did. And the, obviously that was very successful. <laughs> so, um, so let's see. So, okay. So getting to the book, the second book, um, Hermetic Marriage of Art and Alchemy, there's two parts and part one is called Alchemy and Imagination. And it, you go through the four art movements of the early 20th century. Um, well, Romanticism is not 20th century exactly, but you go through the four art movements um, and so romanticism, symbolism, Dada, and surrealism. And um, I really enjoyed like the history, the art history lesson that that provided. That was really because, you know, for somebody who's not an artist, sometimes these things seem like kind of out there and it's hard to even understand what in the heck are they even doing, you know? And so it was really, I was really like, oh, okay, I get it now. A, a lot more than I did. Um, and I, I even, I really enjoyed like some of the particular examples you used of like biographical sketches. And I was going into Astro Data Bank and like looking at the charts of people and stuff. Yeah. <laughs> you know, doing my little astro nerd thing. Um, and, and at some point in time, probably because I have a little bit of experience with alchemy, you know, I started to get a sense that these these um different sort of chapters or historical eras or movements of the art were unfolding in in a similar way that the alchemical opus is seen to unfold and i was like is that just me or <laughs> because i if you stated explicitly i missed it in the first part and i checked in with you and you were like yeah that's that's pretty much what's going on and so I thought, oh, well, like, number one, wow, that's really profound. Like, it kind of, it kind of 
makes it really obvious that something bigger, whatever you want to call it, whether you want to call it God or in hermetic philosophy, we would call it the one, you know, the prime mover, whatever. Something like that's like the clearest evidence that something bigger was at work here. The fact that these four art movements just kind of unfolded in a clearly alchemical way is really mm -hmm. like pretty amazing. Yeah. 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 I mean, that was part of what inspired me to write about those four movements in particular, mm -hmm. starting with Romanticism right. in the 1800s. Um, and really the way I saw it, and this was mostly after I started doing all the research that I started to kind of see it this way, mm -hmm. um, with the Enlightenment era shift in values toward more rationality and science and objectivity, mm -hmm. um, both alchemy and the imagination kind of entered a period of disrepute and yeah. they have kind of been in that space ever since. Yeah. Um, but with romanticism, they were reacting and rebelling against that and saying, no, our feelings, our subjective world has a reality of its own. Mm -hmm. So they were asserting the right to express that through their art. Yeah. And if we think about the first stage of the alchemical opus as being like a putrefaction, the nigredo, the blackening, yeah. uh, that death of the imagination is sort of where that begins, right? And so right. that rebellion is the beginning of that process. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Beautiful, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah I, I really probably of all the art movements I mean I, I identify with that romantic in particular the American transcendentalists I I think they're sort of romantics aren't they yeah I mean yeah. I think they would fall into that yeah, yeah. um yeah. and and then um and so do you want to talk a little bit about each movement and maybe so we talked about romanticism and the negredo you want to talk about each one maybe and talk and then talk about how the alchemy is unfolding and through that process yeah well one of the things that i focused on throughout all four movements was some of the the parallels between alchemy and art and also the way that these different the artists of these different periods were influenced by the occult by spiritualism right. and by alchemy uh, so with Romanticism, there was a real reverence for nature, um, both in its purifying effects, but also in its great uh, power as sort of a representative of the irrationality of the hidden realms of the inner world mm -hmm. and of emotionality. Mm -hmm. um, so they were interested in both of those aspects of nature. And the alchemist is also very much uh, an observer and a student of nature. That's right. kind of throughout all of the different periods of alchemy. That's always a part of it is um, reverence for and the observation of nature mm -hmm. and also observation of the celestial uh, spheres and things that are happening astrologically. Yeah, um, the sky is nature too. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so there was that aspect of romanticism and nature was kind of like a, a gateway to the transcendental to a more expanded state of consciousness or awareness. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, just the focus on imagination, the feeling world, the subjective reality, and the expression of really intense passion. Um, yeah, you see and sort of that in regaining that after it had been lost or or disallowed or, you know. Yeah, because with yeah. the like, neoclassical style, it's just so like, contained and rigid and formulaic mm -hmm. and um mm -hmm. they were trying to break free of all of those rules mm -hmm. and their, their own almost um, like a teenage rebellion of sorts i suppose <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah 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 and then symbolism you know grew out of romanticism later in the 1800s mm -hmm. uh, but it was also reacting in its own way to new forms of realism um, like naturalism that had developed um, this sort of biomechanical view of nature right. and they were also rebelling against the industrial age and sort of the ugliness of all of that development that was happening and mm -hmm. the shifting of the outer world and for them 
they wanted to escape into the inner world of dreams and decadence and mm -hmm. intoxication and fantasy. Mm -hmm. So both the romantics and the symbolists were really obsessed with everything archaic, medieval, Gothic architecture, mm -hmm. uh, the East, everything that felt very exotic, you know, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, mystical. Right. And it's heavily influenced the art that they were creating, which had a lot of mythic undertones, um, but also translated through their very personal subjective world, um, not just direct representations of myths, you know, it was like their personal experience of them. Right, their lived experience of being in that myth, living yeah. that. Yeah. 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 It's funny because, you know, for me, when I... I literally, you know, rebelled a little late, uh, actually, in my 20s. And I, so I left college because like, and it was literally a lot like that. Like, I would just, all of the rationality and everything is like, I don't want to live like this. I don't want to spend the rest of my life like doing equations, you know. Mm -hmm. And I went looking for magic. And I, and I remember like, standing on the side of the road hitchhiking and realizing like, I'm like and I'm wondering like why are these people helping and people were so generous and I was like why are these people helping me and I realized like dude you're living a symbol like this is this is a sim like allowing these people to help help you is is allowing yourself to be a symbol of like that sort of you know whether you want to call it a Christian ideal or you know altruism or whatever I realized mm -hmm. like I was lit I was living these symbols I remember one time when I was at a Buddhist monastery and I, there were these two monks and I realized like one was a lot like Jupiter and one was a lot like Saturn, you know? And I was like, oh my God, like I'm living mm -hmm. this stuff, you know? <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I've, I've had those experiences so many times, you know, where I'll suddenly realize that I'm living out one of the Greek myths or something, you know, and I can see mm -hmm. exact parallels between my own behavior and this yes. myth. And when you can bring that reality to that connection, mm -hmm. you can transform it. You can then begin to evolve that myth. Right. And I think in that way, it's this really beautiful thing where we're actually um, helping to evolve the stories of the gods. Mm -hmm. You know, it's wow. our, they're living through us. You know, we give mm -hmm. them being through right. our our lives and right. things that it's, it's almost like these old stories that you know each generation like you know they you know tells the whatever you know whatever version of uh shakespeare or or the odyssey or iliad or like these stories just get told over and over again but each mm -hmm. each generation has to do it in their own way yeah 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 so and this this process has to do with the al what's called the albedo phase. It's it's sort of lunar, mm -hmm. being able to see the world symbolically. Exactly. Is a lunar yeah. function, right? Yeah. So after that kind of putrefying process or calcinating process of the negredo, where we're kind of reduced and brought down to our our lowest point, um, then things begin to transform into the albedo. And there's different ways that that happens. And I talk about that in the book, but the difference really is like, the nigredo is this kind of darkness, this dying, this letting go, um, surrender um, and acknowledgement of shadow aspects within the self, acknowledgement of those unconscious primal aspects. Uh, and then the albedo, like you said, is more of a symbolic journey. Um, like entering the lunar waters, being submersed and dissolved into a greater body of being, of awareness, mm -hmm. where- it's like realizing you're dreaming, realizing you're living a symbol, you know? Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. It's stepping into the dream. It's where you might feel flooded with synchronicities or yeah. symbolic meanings, double meanings behind things that people are saying or things that you're seeing in your in your outer world connections between things that you're dreaming in your waking life you begin mm -hmm. to see how the inner and the outer worlds are really one and the same thing and this can be extremely overwhelming especially if you're <laughs> not very grounded <laughs> yeah. um and so in the book i talk about certain artists like leonora carrington who sort yeah. of went very far into that lunar world 
um, yeah. or Gerard de Nerval, the Romantics. Was her um, partner that guy Ernst? Max Leonora? Ernst. Leonora yeah. and Max were a couple, right? Yeah. yeah. So I looked at their charts and they were like born in the same uh, phase of Mercury. I noticed that right away. And I was like, okay, so they, they like their minds, like that was a marriage of minds, I think. Like they really got each other probably. Yeah. 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 That was really neat to, to, to see that kind of stuff going on. Um, and I mean, I'm trying to remember Max kind of lost it a little bit too, didn't he? In his own way. Um, not quite to the same extent, but I suppose you could say that. Yeah. I mean, he was, I think he was maybe more grounded or I'm not sure. A little more experienced. Yeah. I don't think he was ever, um, committed or anything okay there was someone else there well there's a few different people who go through that experience you know and yeah it's mm -hmm. a it's definitely one of the hazards of um taking the the lunar path yeah and i think within the alchemical opus that's where the next phase comes in where we start to integrate the two worlds mm -hmm. um where we come back to solid ground. And so one of the processes that I talk about in that third chapter of the opus, the Citrini test mm -hmm. is um, coagulation. So mm -hmm. things coming back together. Yeah. So in alchemy, the basic formula, right? Is solve at coagula, right. dissolve and bring back together through coagulation. Mm -hmm. So the breakdown and then the return, yeah. uh, death and resurrection. Right. Um, but yeah, to be able to dive into that lunar sea to be able to go into those um, very um, nebulous realms and then come back with something that can then be brought to form through the creative process. That's, that's a real gift to be able to mm -hmm. do that. Yeah. Um, and also yeah. having a creative process or a ritual practice or a physical practice like yoga or exercise of some kind, all of those things can help us to keep one foot on solid ground so that we can go into those other nebulous realms without losing ourselves completely. Yeah. Yeah. For me, astrology was kind of the gift of the albedo. I mean, I had a dream where I saw Venus inside the sun and I, I somehow I decided to find, to find out what that meant. And so I, I located an ephemeris, which is a table of planetary positions, you know, Mm -hmm. And I figured out that Venus and the sun were conjunct the day I had that dream. And I was like, that became my sort of grounding um, practice to to learn to live, you know, symbolically. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's really incredible how how often because I pay attention to things that are going on astrologically, mm -hmm. but sometimes I kind of let myself, you know, just live life. And then sure, I'll observe yeah. the connections anyway, you know, yeah. I'll have a dream or something will happen. And I'll be like, well, that's interesting. And then I'll look at the right. planet situation. And I'll be like, <laughs> okay, that's exactly what that is. <laughs> right. yeah. yeah. It's the same way for me, even though I'm a professional astrologer, I hardly ever get to look at my chart because I'm always looking at everybody <laughs> else's, you know, and I'll uh -huh. be like, maybe I should look at that, you know, <laughs> <laughs> And so after the symbolists, we have the Dadaists. Yeah, so the Dadaists, um, this was another sort of uh, swing of the pendulum where, you know, the decadence of the previous era was really not, it didn't make sense in the so social climate that Dada emerged in mm -hmm. with the war and everything. And yeah. um, this they the really wanted world to, war, right? yeah, First World yeah. War. Yeah. They yeah. really wanted to kind of, break art down to its basic components you know mm -hmm. and so there's a sort of destructivism and negativism and everything dada is it's anti-art it's anti-politics yeah. it's anti-dada even you know yeah. um, <laughs> right. so they kind of just turned art on Reminds its head grunge you know like uh <laughs> kurt cobain was like anti-grunge but he was like the grunge icon you know it's like <laughs> it's like yeah it's kind of that same thing yeah <laughs> yeah yeah so there were a few different things that the dadaists did like um using the element of chance which the surrealists would continue to work with but you know like collage or photo montage mm -hmm. um kind of taking apart the the new 
photographic newsprint that was emerging media that was emerging mm -hmm. and reconfiguring it in a new way to give it new meaning yeah. or cutting up newspaper articles and reconfiguring the words mm -hmm. to create kind of irrational poetry right or reciting um poetry that was basically just nonsense nonsensical sounds you know mm -hmm. um and another aspect was like marcel Duchamp and his uh ready maids yeah. so art was just like found art. in a toilet on a, a urinal on on a on a on a stand and you know that i'm sure people yeah. were like but you know that was really interesting because i have a friend who lives over here and you know, i'm in rural i'm in rural appalachia right and so um like it's only been i don't even know how recently it's been but i actually have a trash service you know but for years and years and years there was nothing like that and people just their trash in the woods you know <clears throat> and so my friend is always back on his property cleaning up the woods and stuff and when he finds stuff he collects it and then he repurposes it and puts it back together in these like um collages or in these you know um collections and stuff and I'm, and when i was reading that i was like hey i figured out what you are you're a dadaist man <laughs> there you go <laughs> yeah no but it's really it's i was like oh my god like you know because for, it's like the it's a really interesting attitude because for me a lot of times i'll be going along and i'll find a piece of trash and i'm really like ah you know i'm just i'm kind of peeved and i'm like i gotta clean up somebody else's mess blah 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 and i saw this guy and he's like oh it's a chance to be creative and i'm like what a much more healthy attitude that is, you know? Yeah. A, like even just picking up trash on your property is an, is an opportunity to be creative. Mm -hmm. um, but also it reminded me of like, um, you know, when I was, you know, homeless or, or poor or whatever, and I would, you know, have to, you know, make do and find stuff in dumpsters and everything. It's like, it's, it's, it's like a really sort of, grounded actually way of being where you're just taking stuff from everyday life and repurposing it and making it into art i probably enjoyed that one that was one of the most enjoyable things because i could really relate to that i was like yeah i get that like it makes mm -hmm. sense to me you know and it seems like a really kind of it's almost folk artsy in a way you know i could see a lot of folk art being like that like having that sort of dada spirit oh yeah 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 and it, in a way like well there's an abundance of refuse right right <laughs> and sort of like the things that have been deconstructed and cast away that are being They're brought already... together and reintegrated yep. into something new that's actually beautiful or useful in some way yep yeah so that very much relates to that third part of the process right the reintegration coagulation mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah bringing back the the stuff and repurposing it the so um yeah the citronatus is like um moving from so it's yellow citronatus means yellowing mm -hmm. so we had the, the blackening the whitening and now we're moving into the yellow which is the beginning of the solar work so yeah like, so like taking so that stuff that's just scattered about willy-nilly like in a, in a in a random fashion and bringing some order to it that's the solar function you know mm -hmm. of bringing order to chaos right right yeah and so that third phase the citrinitas is like a transition between the the whitening and the final reddening um so a lot of i think in later years a lot of alchemists sort of like did away with considering that as one of the phases so you just right. see the white and red yeah but I think it's still really important because there's a lot of things happening in that transition. Mm -hmm. um, like you said, the sun is sort of entering the process, the, mm -hmm. the warming element of the sun, yeah. soul inspiration or the effluence of the divine coming down through the solar rays and kind of providing this uh, ferment mm -hmm. of inspiration that kind of lifts us up and guides us upward in the work. Mm -hmm. uh, also, uh, transmuting the the white stone the lunar stone into the red stone um the heat of the sun being part of that process and right. also the gold of the sun right um 
Yeah. Yeah. So I think solar inspiration. So whereas the whitening is the lunar inspiration, mm -hmm. that submersion, then the solar inspiration kind of brings us back up, um, mm -hmm. connecting the above and the below. Right. And in the final stage, the reddening, that's where the full union takes place between the above and below. Right. And so you, so the, the final art movement is the, the surrealists. Um, and so, so explain how surrealism comes from, from Dada or how it sort of, how it sort of, not necessarily, it kind of does come from Dada, I guess, but how it sort of represents this next stage of unfolding. Well, I think surrealism sort of, a lot of the early surrealists were the non-conforming Dadaists. Yeah. So it did come out of Dada and they used a lot of the same essential techniques of like working with chance, um, accessing the unconscious through irrational methods. Right. Um, but I think for them, there was more of an emphasis on harmony and union mm -hmm. um, rather than the Dadaist, everything just being about deconstructing, you know? Right. Um, I think the surrealists moved more towards finding that place of union and the way they saw it, it was like a place that already existed. And we just had to kind of strip away the obstructions to that union. Mm. Um, so they worked with automatism, um, automatic writing, right. automatic drawing, automatic painting. Um, and there were other artists who had already been working with these methods that weren't considered surrealist, but the surrealists really kind of brought it out. Mm -hmm. And um, it's really just a way of um, sort of entering a trance state to where you're not allowing your rational mind to filter the things that are coming through. And so you're just getting a spontaneous outflowing of, of the unconscious, mm. whether that's written or spoken or drawn out or painted. Mm -hmm. And in that way, um, you're allowing those kind of irrational feelings and things to emerge in a way that you see them externally and then you can create a dialogue with them. Mm -hmm. And they always talked about it in a two-part process where there's the automatism, just letting it flow out. Mm -hmm. And then there's the refinement where you apply your skill and technique as an right. artist to give it actual form and structure and beauty. Yeah. It reminds me of something I heard Hemingway say once, you know, basically just write drunk, edit sober, you know? Mm. <laughs> yeah. It's kind of kind of the same thing. Um, yeah, yeah and it's a lot of different techniques, you know, intoxication, surely, uh, but also fasting. Right. And was one of them mm -hmm. to end the states and to be able to really allow that automatic process to flow. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, one of the things that one of the questions that that comes up for me is like, um where might we be in that process today? Like, how do you see the world or maybe just the art world? But it, I feel like, like that deconstruction of Dada, I feel that to be like a lot, like the postmodern and like if people that are obsessed with Lacan and all of this, you know, kind of um, like a, a lot of the intellectual background, I see like a, a deconstructive kind of, um, behind it and so I'm wondering like are we kind of in need of sort of our own neo-surrealist like union movement at this point in time do you think well I think it's happening I yeah. think I think collectively we're in a state of the Negredo process yeah we're kind of confronted with the deep dark shadows of our collective well, yeah. humanity <laughs> and lack of humanity mm. and with that we're seeing the breakdown of a lot of um, social structures, the decline of our right. civilization, you know, right. and it's a really painful, difficult thing to watch and to be a part of. Yeah. And with the war unfolding, the wars unfolding, um, I think that's also part of it as well as like um, the deep shadows being expressed. And mm -hmm. like the surrealists and the Dadaists observed, um, this was the early days of Freud's work with the unconscious, you know, and so they saw war as an expression of the suppressed unconscious, right. the result of what happens when we don't deal with those irrational parts of ourselves. Right. So for them, their art movement was really a reaction to that in a way of saying like, look, we need to look at these deep parts of ourselves 
um, we need to acknowledge our shadows and let mm-hmm. them out the light so that we're not projecting them out into the world onto these enemies, you know? Yeah. Uh, and we're seeing that to an extreme today uh, mm-hmm. with the dehumanization of entire populations of people. Um, and well, the- and just dehuman- dehumanization of the opposing political party, you know? Yeah. Like- you know, mm-hmm. like, oh, you're, you're not like me, so I get to cancel you, you know, or whatever, like, it's not nearly as drastic, but, you know, you know, trying to take away someone's ability to make a living is, you know, pretty, pretty serious business. Actually, it's violent, it's an act of violence. Oh, yeah. And, and I think that's something that uh, goes unsaid from the, you know, that, um, you know, that it is an act of violence and that and that you know um maybe it needs to be you know thought through a little bit better of how exactly we handle our disagreements you know yeah um, yeah i mean i guess yeah i guess what i'm another question that i had is like um you know in terms of like uh where we are with art today like in terms of like postmodernism and stuff like where where do you put that where do you put postmodernism in terms of any of these four or in terms of like the alchem alchemical process because i feel like um like when when you were going through these four i was like okay i get that like i could live in that world but like where the heck are we you know like (laughs) right right like you know like what it's, it feels like maybe to me, and maybe it's just because I'm not seeing it right, but it feels like maybe there was something that was unfolding and then maybe we got off track. I don't know. Like, how do you well, see modern art in, in relation to this, I guess is what I'm saying. To be honest, I would have to do a lot more research yeah. uh, in the art movement since surrealism with postmodernism and right. Um, in order to give a thorough answer to that. Sure. Yeah. Um, That's fair. There's a lot of modern art that doesn't resonate for me. Um, Mm -hmm. But, you know, I'm just happy people are being creative, even if I don't personally resonate with it, you know? So um, do you think abstract expressionism like Jackson Pollock and stuff like that? I mean, that's pretty much automatism. Like just, he's just what comes out, like literally just, Instantly. Yeah, and it, there's a very physical aspect to that, right? And mm-hmm. emotionality of just color and lines and movement. Yeah. Um, so I yeah, I think that can that be like a form of automatism, you know. Yeah. 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 Um though and maybe it's, you know, imbued with a lot of personal meaning as well for them. Right. Um, it's a I mean, it does kind of remind me of you talk about frottage as a technique that they used, mm-hmm. you know, like just mm-hmm. getting different um, textures on a piece of paper from random places. You mm-hmm. know, that kind of reminds me of the abstract expressionism a little bit too. Yeah. So. Yeah. Um, okay. So now part two of the book, you actually take us through the magnum opus on a more, um, not exactly technical, but more focused on the actual al- alchemy and you talk about the four um, colors that we that we mentioned before: the negretto, the albedo, the citronatus, and the rubedo. Mm-hmm. And you specifically go through them at length in terms of these uh, twelve alchemical operations. Um, and I mean, I could name those off. We can talk about them if you want to. But um, one thing that that I was wondering about, like. You know, if you, I don't know if you're familiar with Dennis Houck's book about the Emerald Tablet. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So he goes through seven operations in that book, right? Right. And, and there, so, and you talked about earlier, like, in fact, you mentioned on page 103, I think that not only did, so there's, so there's one scheme where they do albedo, sorry, negretto, albedo, rubedo. So there's like three colors. And then there's another scheme where the citronatus comes between the, the albedo and the rubido and then there's mm-hmm. another one even where the rubido leads to a purple stage yeah right and then there's the one with how where he does seven of them 
Um, and then there's the one with the 12, right? And so I guess what I'm wondering is um, how did you come? And one of the things that I think it's really great that you mentioned when you mentioned about these different color schemes is you were like, but you have to make the work your own. So you have to make creative choices of which one of these schemes am I going to use, right? Mm -hmm. um, depending on what you're trying to do or whatever. So I'm just curious, like, how did you come about to use the four and the 12? How did that become personal for you? That was really out of my own experience of going through the processes okay, in my yeah. life. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. I think that's why that resonated so strongly for me is because I lived those four stages to a very um, clear expression. Uh -huh. It's Starting... clear in your writing that you're familiar with the journey. Yeah. 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 Um, and also, I think um, with the four, it, it works well with the four seasons as well. And so I think it's easy for people to kind of understand those four phases, you know, yep. the death of winter, the negredo, the rebirth of spring, mm -hmm. the development and maturation of summer and right. the completion of autumn. Right. The harvest. Yeah. The fruit, uh, right. Yeah. Yeah. The mm -hmm. reddening of the fruit. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that's think literally that's really... when you get those nice red uh, apples. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> cool. And also the four stages come into play when you read alchemical texts in the perfection of the philosopher's stone. Whereas the seven stages, that's like the transmutation of the metals from my understanding, or mm -hmm. like um, sometimes the three is more related to the making of spagyrics. Yeah. Um, so yeah, the four is really related to the philosopher's stone. And to me, that's really the philosopher's stone is both the unconscious uh, the prima materia, the stone comes out of the prima materia or the first matter, mm -hmm. the dark within us, right. the unknown, that place of pure potentiality mm. and the imagination as well as being yeah. that place of just pure potential where anything is possible. And it's up to us to bring order to that. And um, through the refinement and perfection of the imagination, then we're able to perfect the philosopher's stone in the sense that the imagination is imbued with the power of uh, miraculous transmutations of matter. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Beautiful. So yeah, if you're going to start with four, then of course the 12 is kind of a natural pairing with that. Yeah. 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 And the 12 are related to the Zodiac signs and everything. Mm -hmm. So yeah, no, I mean, I, I got to tell you, I probably have, I have the least experience with the four in particular, the citronatus. I'm very familiar with the spagyric method and with the metal method, but this one was relatively new for me. And I was like, wow, you know, I'm, I really appreciate having been exposed to it because in particular, the citronatus, I mean, um, that I, I remember when you were talking about the image of um, sowing the coins in the soil. I was mm -hmm. like, my, my imagination was just like going crazy with that. I was like, oh, wow. I want to, I want to actually like make images of that. You know, it's like, I, I felt like I had to put the book down and go play with that image because <laughs> <laughs> it was really vivid. Like, yeah, let's sow gold coins and grow money trees, you know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I love that. I love that it inspired you in that way. Right on. Yeah. So um so i recent so i'm gonna ask a, a sort of like a practitioner nerdy question next a little bit of one um okay. it's a little bit maybe more advanced but now that we've given people an outline of the book um i recently presented at astromagia uh 23 and i was talking to there i was talking to sasha ravich about the constellation hydra mm -hmm. and she was she was um really into that and and everything and then synchronistically i was reading the section in the book about the negredo section about the operation of calcination um mm -hmm. and on page 128 there's there's this image of a lion devouring a serpent right at the beginning of the work and the th the th the crazy thing about that that never occurred to me before is that so the constellation Hydra is literally right below the constellation of Leo. So there's oh, yeah. literally a lion and a serpent right there. And I was like, oh my God. I was like, that's, 
that's a really interesting synchronicity. Like I was just talking to Sasha about this and we were talking about how the stars and the lion, you know, line up like Jim Morrison had the stars of both of those in his chart and, and stuff. And so I was like, wow. And then it also occurred to me that the first two stages on the journey of Hercules, the first two labors, Hercules were the lion and the hydra. Mm -hmm. You know, and I was like, holy smokes, is that alchemy? Is they Were they like early alchemists or something? I felt like that was a, there was something definitely there. And then, and then later when I got to the, um, albedo section where you're talking about sublimation you were talking about the tarot card trump trump 11 strength or crowley calls it lust um uh -huh. and you were actually talking about like the difference between those two in terms of like just pure sexual energy that's like libidinal and procreative versus you know a a, a more sublimated that is actually artistic creativity so strength is being able to take that libidinal procreative energy and raise it to a form of creating like art or music or, or whatever, yeah. you know? Yeah. And so it's, so there again, I saw like, okay, so you literally have the Hydra, the like libidinal procreative energy, and then you have the, the lion, the actual art and stuff. Um, but then later in the section where we, talk about the citronatus and and digestion this image comes back up again where they talk about here the lion is overcome by the dragon right so there's a it uh the the lion which is sulfur is overcome by the dragon which represents mercury and devoured by him mm -hmm. so i was like wow i found this thread really interesting and um I don't know exactly what my question is. <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted to share that with you. Like, um, first of all, have you ever seen that connection between uh, the the labors of Hercules and some kind of alchemical process? Oh, certainly. Yeah. Okay. okay. Yeah. And also um, a lot of connections with the 36 decans and yeah. the three of the decans, which I've been studying this year. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and definitely alchemical themes for sure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's not fresh on my mind to be able to to talk about them right now. But yeah, so so in the beginning of the work, if the lion, which is the sulfur, which is like the male principle, corrosive principle, mm -hmm. devouring the serpent, that represents like in calcination, like we literally need to we have ideas about the world that don't work anymore. And those need to be deconstructed, like Dada is just break it up, break it apart, like mm -hmm. just blow it up because it doesn't work. And so the lion devouring the 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 um, serpent represents that process of like just blackening, like burning it up and getting mm -hmm. the the stuff that's no longer useful out of the way. Right. Yeah, it's like the the difference between the fixed and the volatile. So we want to volatilize what's fixed and we want to fix what's volatile. So right. the fix being those like rigid limiting structures that need to be broken down mm -hmm. and the volatile being the sort of flighty vaporous things that we need to be able to fix to get a hold on, you know? Right. And I think our thought structures are like that and our imagination is like that. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes our imagination is volatile and it's kind of flying away from us and we need to get a hold of it fix it, focus it so that it's directed in a useful mm -hmm. way. Right. Um, sometimes it's too fixed and too rigid and limited. And we want to dissolve that, break it down and liberate it, you know? Right. And so there's this kind of back and forth between those two. Right. And so that's why they always say the work is circular because it's like, you know, as mm -hmm. soon as the lion is devouring the serpent and then you come around later and now the serpent is devouring the lion. Because, yeah exactly yeah, yeah because now the the flighty stuff needs to be fixed and made useful and stuff so yeah mm -hmm. i just thought that was really interesting um and i and uh i'm looking forward to like uh 
exploring that a little bit more in particular with like, you know, trying to figure out like, how can, like the thing that occurred to me is like that, um, that a talisman of um, Hydra, for instance, might be conducive to a particular stage of the work. Mm -hmm. Whereas a talisman for Leo might be, you know, like if you did a talisman of a red lion, for instance, like that would be indicative of, of course, the red lion is the beginning of the work, really, you know, whereas a hydra stage might might be more useful in a later stage where you're trying to engage the unconscious and trying to raise that, mm -hmm. right? You oh, know? yeah, I could see a lot of potential for that. Yeah, right. So yeah. like literally you could you could have almost like a series of talismanic operations that sort of go with or or um sort of uh uh support the different stages of the work. Oh yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 So that that was pretty interesting. And that brings up another question that I had that well a series of questions that are sort of about like how do we live this journey? Because, um, you know, if it is a circular journey and we're always kind of like, you know, trying to make the, the, the fixed volatile and make the volatile fixed, um, mm -hmm. what happens when people sort of jump in, in the middle of the process, you know, let's say, right. Like for instance, when I, after I became an astrologer, my my first real um exposure to alchemy was through um fermentation because i wanted to brew beer <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> right and so i started doing fermentation and i mean i knew i was doing alchemy but i didn't really know what i was i didn't really know what i was doing in terms of like the full opus like i just wanted to make beer and i was like well, it's also alchemy. So that's cool. And, you know, and what I realized is like, in my case, I had been through the Negretto and I had received the albedo, you know, the dream where I became an astrologer. So that was kind of the right place for me to jump in. Yeah. Actually, like I can see that on hindsight, but I also wonder, like, I think a lot of people hesitate to get into this stuff because they're sort of afraid that if they jump in, and they do it in the wrong order or whatever they jump in in the, in the middle of the thing that they're going to mess it up or and so i guess my question is like if if somebody does that let's say somebody just jumps in and decides to start fermenting stuff or whatever do you uh -huh. think do you think they're um by necessity they're going to be drawn back to the negretto back to the beginning of the opus to sort of complete that not necessarily. I, okay. I think it's circular. Right. I also think it's not necessarily linear. Right. You right. know, I think it does work linearly a lot of the time, but not always. Right. Um, so I don't think there's any one way to enter it or to go about it or, and I don't think it should be forced either. Right. You know? Um, like for me, the Negredo was just something I found myself in. And it wasn't until I started learning about alchemy that I was able to see where I was. Yeah. Uh, and then the path unfolded from there. But, you know, I I've guess. been through that yeah. process many times since then. Mm -hmm. uh, it's always been a little bit easier since that first really intense Negredo phase. But um, yeah. generally, I do see the Albedo follows the sort of like opening the return of the light. And then the maturation of a process and then the completion. Yeah. But there's multiple other phases going on within that. Right. It's not cut and dry. And I think, you know, if you pick up this book and you just read it front to back, you're going to have an understanding of the range of processes, the range of phases that you might experience. Yeah. Um, but ultimately, Literally think, a map. Yeah. Yeah. I think everyone needs to trust their own process, you know? Yeah everyone needs to make the art for themselves and this is what 
the philosophers of old told us, you know, and that's why we see so much variation in all of the alchemical texts and in the recipes <laughs> right. Right. and in the stages. They would literally um, mess every up single the one order of them. sometimes to try to hide it, right? <laughs> That was part of it too. But almost every single one of them tells you this is the one true way. I'm right, going to tell right, you all the right. secrets. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess that answers my question. Like, yeah, obviously there's, yeah, I guess sometimes I, I um, maybe I'm just overthinking or being a little neurotic, but from a sort of, um, I feel responsible. Like if I create a talisman for someone that is like supposed to be like a, a love talisman or heroes gamos or whatever yeah and and that's sort of like in the middle of the work right and so some and i've seen it where like um counterintuitively that can't that has seemingly activated a negretto process like rather mm. than what the desired outcome it's like and and so either i need to tell people like that this comes with a disclaimer like you, you you might be it might be like a game of shoots and ladders like it might take you back to the beginning or b yeah. i just need to trust that like you know the process is going to to do for them whatever it needs to do for them and that's that's just the way it works you know and just yeah well i think both right like a disclaimer yeah. saying like the ultimate result of this talisman for the heroes gamos may require you to go through some other things first. Yeah. Yeah. So it's like, don't expect yeah. it to just manifest directly, you know, right, because it's right. going to, you need to go through a certain process in order to reach that still. Yeah. It's not like a magic bullet. Right. 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 Yeah. But uh, it'll yeah. facilitate that process. Yeah. I think I am actually going to, um, you know, it's a little bit. Yeah. Anyway, thank you. I appreciate that. Um, and so, and and I guess my final question for you is like, um, you know, it seems to me that we probably go through the opus many times at some point if we stay with it, right? And so I'm wondering like, is there a way to that we can sort of um, stay in the creative flow? Is there a way that we can sort of reach a place where we just sort of like, in the creative flow where we where we can just sort of um you know where we don't have to go back through the negredo every time and we can just kind of be flowing and just kind of churning out creative works does that is that yeah i think totally so the image of the divine hermaphrodite or the rebus right the double matter from mm -hmm. restina double matter yeah. um that is the two the active and the passive, the male and the female, the yep. positive, the negative, those two polarities united in one body. And yep. so it's depicted as one body with two heads, male and female, the king and the queen united in one, sometimes with wings, uh, usually having conquered the dragon of chaos, you know, the sort of irrational primal forces of the unconscious yep. um, and standing a atop a globe that's like a unified globe combining yep heaven and earth for the astrologer geeks out there that's the picture on the front of rob hand's book about sect s-e-c-t the picture she just described he used an alchemical <laughs> image on the cover of that because it's like day and night sect is about day and night in astrology yeah totally yeah, yeah. anyway sorry i didn't mean to yeah interrupt. but i think when we're able to unify those opposing principles within ourselves that's when we have conquered the dragon of chaos in which we're not in a state of flow where we're just being kind of directed by these unconscious forces of fate and fortune. Mm -hmm. uh, but when we're in that sweet spot where the union of the conscious and the unconscious takes place, then we are consciously aware of what we're doing. We're like we're totally present and focused. And yet it's coming from this spontaneous inspired place within us. Yeah. Um, inspiration. I think of like, uh, to be infused with the spirit, Mercury, mm -hmm. that dissolving aspect that helps us to enter the flow state. Beautiful. So I think it's totally possible to be there. And that is an aspect of the Rubedo, the final phase of the process. Mm -hmm. um, and when I'm in those places in my life, it's just, that's the best. Yeah, sweet, right? 
Yeah. yeah. But, you know, there's always new things that emerge that need to be broken down, that need to be processed. Right. And, and I so think, I find yeah. going back to that Negredo. Yeah. And I think that's a really good point, too. Like, um, it, it's easy, like, when things go wrong or when there's blackening, to it's like so, instinctively you might say, oh, geez, I must have screwed up, right? Or or why, why is this happening to me? Or like, but actually, I think, you know, to reframe it, like, it's because you've grown, mm -hmm. right? That, you're ready like, for something new to emerge. You're ready for something new. Like you're literally needing to break out of your shell to shed your skin. Mm -hmm. So it's a sign of growth, not a sign. It's a sign of doing something well, you're rather than doing something wrong, you know? Yeah, and... Mm -hmm. Think of it like the earth, the body is the earth, right? And sometimes the earth breaks open and new things emerge and they're in a sort right. of raw state. And yeah. the alchemist is always looking at nature and saying, how can I accelerate the processes of nature? And so living alchemically is the same. It's like, how can I accelerate the transmutation of these raw materials within myself mm -hmm. to reach my full potential and express that divine will as clearly as I can? Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Well, hey, it's been wonderful having you back on the show. And thank you so much for these incredible books. Um, I do want to ask you before you go, do you have any more uh, books in the, in the hopper or are you just <laughs> concentrating on your artwork? Well, right now I'm, I'm studying the Deccans and doing a lot of research on the Deccans and I've been posting about them since Aries. Right, started. You're doing that. You're doing that on your, um, Mm -hmm. on patreon uh, on patreon right yeah so if people want to join me for that the the blog is just a dollar a month so it's really quite affordable um, <laughs> you can read about the 36 decans and mm -hmm. then um, that'll probably end up in book form eventually i'd like nice. to do some art around it with the next cycle um, yeah so that and then working on a zodiac series of paintings and um, yeah i saw those on your uh on your uh uh instagram yeah gorgeous yeah. Thank you. I yeah. want the ram. <laughs> that's the only one that's actually done so far. <laughs> yeah. yeah, cool. I'll definitely have to get a print of that one. Yeah, awesome. Well, thanks again so much. And, uh, you know, maybe we'll have you back on the show sometime to talk about the deacons. I would love that. Yeah. Okay. Sounds and great. And it's been a pleasure, Gary. Thanks so much for having me on the show again. You're welcome. All right. Till next time. All right. Take care. Bye-bye.